cardiologist out of Albany, New York. Um, thanks for all, for all coming tonight. I, um, I work with Dr. Gary Siskin and Dr. Kenny Mandato, and we have been taking care of patients with CCSP after about three years. And I'm here to talk a little bit about our experience and also about the trial that we have. So, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about CCSPI. I assume that everybody in the room has heard about it. Um, you know, just a brief history. You know, the, the etiology of MS related to venous disease dates back over 100 years to, um, to Dr. Charcot. Um, and then uh, it had been it had come up you know, over the years, but most recently, Dr. Zamboni, who is a vascular surgeon out of Italy, uh, proposed that. Um, narrowing to the veins, draining the, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, the nervous system could contribute to uh, the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about our experience and about, in general, um, CCSVI. And in general, CCSVI right now has a lot of unknowns. Uh, the first unknown is how, what is the best way to make the diagnosis? Um, there are a lot of papers that have come out over the past few years looking at ultrasound as a means of diagnosis. And there's the Zamboni protocol and the McDonald protocol. Um, some studies say that ultrasound is very specific and you can use ultrasound to diagnose uh, aberrant flow in the jugular veins. And other studies, the study out of my center, actually said that ultrasound is not very helpful. Uh, some people think intravascular ultrasound is very helpful. Um, and in fact, it may be, unfortunately, it, uh, intravascular ultrasound is an invasive procedure and also it's not very widely available. So it may not be, and it's also, because it's an invasive test, it's not a great screening exam. Um, MRI and MRV, which is just uh, MR venogram, also hasn't been you know, proven out to be you know, as sensitive for diagnosis. So not a great screening exam. Venogram, I think everyone pretty much agrees, is, is a really good way to make the diagnosis. It's readily available. Um, and can be pretty sensitive. So I think in general people say that it's, it really is the best way right now to make the diagnosis. With exception maybe one person who might be able to tonight. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, treatment is also isn't, is not something that we can all agree on. Uh, angioplasty of stenosis with the jugular veins and ascus vein seems to be what makes people better when they get better. Uh, stent placement has, is controversial. Um, has been plagued by complications. And in general, I think people who are treating CCSVI right now are generally staying away from stent placement, although there was some very early enthusiasm for stent placement, and you know, ultimately may turn out to be the right way. Um, there's some disagreement about post-procedure post treatment, whether patients should be treated with anticoagulation. Some centers put patients on aspirin, some centers put patients on Plavix. Uh, and other real anticoagulation, whether it's with Coumadin, Perdaxa, or Lovenox, you know, people are all over the place and there really isn't any agreement. Uh, also, the results have been mixed. You know, in general, there are lots of studies that show patients when they're followed in the short term can have really great um, responses on their, uh, whether it's um, quality of life questionnaires or fatigue surveys or different scales. So, so lots of retrospective studies have shown some improvement, but not all studies do. And in fact, the premise trial, which was the trial that came out of the University of Buffalo just last month, this was a prospective randomized uh, trial. The premise is prospective randomized endovascular therapy in multiple sclerosis. This was, you know, the gold standard, potentially, um, blinded randomized trial, 19 patients, um, patients either received a sham procedure or received a procedure if they were eligible. Um, physicians who were treating the patient or evaluating the patients, obviously the physicians who are doing the treatment are gonna know whether they're putting a real angioplasty balloon in the patient or not, but uh, the neurologists who evaluated patients before and after did not know, and the patients did not know if they received treatment. Uh, during this trial, a six month follow-up was performed. And there were no significant differences between the two groups, and then there were nine patients who were treated and 10 patients who received the sham procedure. Um, and, and patients also were followed with MRI, and, and some patients in the treatment group did have some progression in their MS lesions on their MRI. Uh, the researchers uh, caution that, well, first they say that, you know, this is a small study um, that ha 
a suggestion that maybe CCSBI isn't an effective treatment, but definitely larger scale studies are necessary. But in light of their findings, they cautioned um, patients and providers against performing this procedure outside of the setting of a clinical trial. So a lot of people in the CCSBI world are very discouraged about these findings. Um, and the question is, does this change everything? And I don't think the answer is yes. Um, we can't disregard the results, but you know we have to think that it's a small trial. There's still lots of room for more research. Um, but how do we move forward? You know, what's the best way to evaluate CCSBI? What's the best way to take care of these patients? Um, you know, CC CCSBI definitely needs further evaluation. Um, we are performing a trial right now. We are in partnership with uh, the Saskatchewan province up in Canada. Um, it is a randomized, <coughs> double, well, not double, blinded control trial, right? control trial um, that has been evaluated and approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration. It's a five, phase two trial. We have received an IDE. Um, we also have our you know, institutional IRB is on board. Um, and the FDA recommended that for it to be clinically significant, that we need to have at least 200 patients enrolled. Any trial that has fewer than 200 patients, can't, you can't make clinical decisions about it. It's not a statistically significant study. Um, and we also have very defined endpoints in our trial. Um, these are the endpoints, you know, there's the primary endpoints, you know, is this a safe procedure and what's the long-term impact? But secondary, what's the short-term impact? Um, you know, are patients relapsing? You know, what range of patients relapse? Um, what changes are seen on MRI? And then also, you know, questionnaires on quality of life. Um, are patients able to perform a 25-foot uh, time walking test? Are there any changes in that? And then also, we're evaluating frequency of thrombosis and restenosis for CCSVI, and the um, impact of uh, CCSVI in the venous you know, internal venous pressure. So these patients are going to be followed for two years, and all these endpoints are going to be measured uh, at intervals along this time period. Um, and everyone is curious what's the status of our trial. We're currently enrolling patients. We don't have very many patients right now. We, um, and in fact, the interest of patients to get enrolled is really just evaporated, which is the problem. We're ready, we're willing, we're able, um, but we just don't have the patients. And we think that some of that is in response to the premise trial, that people are nervous, but also I think the enthusiasm for CC CCSVI is waning. But I will tell you that we are, I mean, we want to know the answers. We've, we've treated many patients, and the things that we have observed are just too compelling to stop. Um, patients report consistent uh, changes. You know, even on the table, we've had patients who, you know, whose feet are objectively cold, um, their fingers and toes warm up on the table. Um, people say that they can see clearly. They're like, like, oh, look at the pattern on the wall. I didn't notice that when I came in the room. People who have had chronic headaches, their headaches disappear on the table. Um, numbness in hands and feet. You know, these are symptoms. These are things that people have reported immediately, and you know, time and time again, patients report this. Um, patients in the short term on our studies have shown significant improvement in their quality of life, um, improvement on their fatigue scale measurements, and report changes in their cognitive clarity. You know, Hot of fog. <laughs> you have a hard time finding that. It's ironic. Um, you know, people say that just goes away. Um, and although it hasn't been reported, we haven't collected the data. Anecdotally, I have many patients who are more than one year out who say they have persistent relief in their fatigue, persistent improvement in their balance, persistent improvement in their headache, relief, and persistent improvement in their cognitive deficits. So, in conclusion, I mean, these stories are just too compelling to ignore. Um, the premise trial definitely is going to um, cool things off. I think people are, are going to be shied away. Perhaps um, funding may be scarce based on this finding. I mean, there's lots of, you know, this definitely um, puts a little bit of a negative spin on things. But I think additional studies are needed, and outcome, you know, long-term outcome data is necessary. <laughs>